Hey guys, it's Chris. Sunday night Q and A live with Chris. That's me. How is everyone? I got my co-host here, Sammy. Sammy, come say hello. Hey, buddy. Did you have a good day? Say hi to all the folks. Uh oh. Looks like we have a network connection. Oh, we're our network connection's back. All right, see, we got some friends on the program. What's up, everybody? It's me, and that's my thoughts. Do you have any thoughts about the Australian Open? Are you sad for Rafa? Maybe. All right, buddy. I'm going to do the show. You hang out. Maybe you want to take a nap or something? Guys, Sammy will probably take a nap or something. How are you guys tonight? I'm doing pretty good. I had a long weekend of teaching, but... I'm feeling pumped for tomorrow. I have to go work. I'm doing ambulance work. I'm actually doing a refresher course. So for three days, I'm going to be studying ambulance skills. So I'm going to be off the internet, off of Facebook, off of everything, just working on ambulance stuff, trying to become a better EMT. Anyway, guys, I'd love to talk tennis tonight. Let me know what your thoughts are. I have a few ideas in my head that we could talk about. I know a lot of people are buzzing about the Australian and Novak and Rafa. So sad for Rafa. Whenever Rafa loses, I get fewer calls because people, people think maybe the Spanish way is dying, not doing so well. If Rafa wins, I get a lot of calls. If Rafa loses, I don't get as many calls. But, but Spanish tennis is not dying. Spanish tennis is struggling a little, but they'll probably have a comeback soon. But I did want to talk about some stats from the Australian Open final. Did you guys know that the average rally length was five shots? It was over four shots. So I guess the statistics are a little off when we say that we should focus more on first strike and the first four shots because the finals of the AO was five shots, the average. And I don't think Rafa played very well. I haven't got a chance to watch the clips yet. I was working all day, but it sounds to me like from the stats that Rafa made a lot of unforced errors. He had, I have the stats here actually, I have it on my other phone, but I think he had 29 forehand unforced errors, which is remarkable for Rafa. I mean, that's one of the greatest shots of all time, maybe, Rafa's forehand. And he said, let's see, I have it here, he made... Third, no, 29, 28 forehand errors. That's, that's amazing. And he had a lot of unforced errors in total, and the match was quite, quite short. And the average rally length was five shots. So guys, what do you think about that? Should we be focusing on the first four shots, or is it the first five shots? Now I'm confused, because I, my understanding was that the game of tennis is changing, and that the first four shots are the most important, and we should focus more on that. Uh, I'm being a little facetious, but... Anyway, let's see who's on the program tonight, and we can continue talking about the AO, and maybe we can talk about the first four shots theory or hypothesis, or maybe it should be called the first five shots theory of training and playing. Let's see. My buddy Jim Kane is watching. What's up, Jim? Thanks for waving, buddy. Guys, if you're logging on and you have any questions about tennis, please let me know. I'd be happy to answer. That's what this show is all about, about answering your questions. It's not just about me rapping on about stuff in my brain, although that is part of the show sometimes. But if you guys have any tennis questions, you want to talk the AO, let me know. You want to talk Novak and Rafa. I know that's on a lot of people's mind. You think Spanish tennis is dying? I know I don't believe it's dying completely. I know Spanish tennis is struggling right now. I think they'll probably have a comeback at some point. But we can talk that and if you have any junior development questions, please let me know. That is part of what I do on this program. I try to help families and players from around the world, especially little guys. I'm known as the prodigy maker. That's my brand. So especially if you have any questions about young kids, 
under 10, under 12, under 14. That's one of my passions is training young children and helping them with high performance, helping develop champions. So if you have a little prodigy, shout out a question. Let me know. If you're working with a prodigy, if you're a coach and you work with kids, let me know if you have any questions about technique or tactics or tennis development, junior development. I love talking, especially technique. Technique is my... My calling in life, I think, is working on the hardware of little prodigies. That's what I love to do. I was going through who's on the program, and looks like we've got some activity here. Jacinta Rosas Guerra is watching. Thank you, Jacinto. Jacinto, thank you for waving. Sounds like you could be a new viewer. I like to get new viewers on the show. Gaju Mangela is watching. Thank you. I hope I don't mispronounce these names. Mike Riggs is watching. I think Mike's a regular on the program. What's up? Guys, thanks for chilling with me on a Sunday night. I'm a little sad because my boy Rafa lost. The Spanish way went down in flames. How can a Spanish guy make that many unforced errors? What's up with that? I guess Novak's just too solid, right? Annie Rockwell is watching. I think Annie's a regular on the show. You Ubiratan Luis De Menezes, Menenze, Menezes. What's up, man? Thanks for watching. Appreciate it. Tim Baton is on the program. What's up, Tim? We got some heavyweights on the show tonight. If you got any questions or comments, Tim, let me know. Donnie Levitt is watching. Donnie's like a regular on my program. This is awesome, Donnie. Thank you for tuning in. Katatoshi Shimizu is watching, another regular on the program. Guys, we have such a great community of intelligent tennis learners on this show. I appreciate all you guys tuning in. Robert, Roberto Arala is watching. I think you're a new viewer. Thank you for tuning in. I appreciate it. This is my Sunday night talk show. I answer questions from around the world. I love talking junior tennis, junior development, and I love talking about Spanish tennis in particular. I know that the AO is on a lot of people's mind. Tim Baton says he's owned mentally by Djokovic the same way after 2010 that Nadal owned Federer. Yeah, I feel badly because I was working all, all day, so I haven't seen clips from the match yet. But I did check some of, some of the statistics, and I managed to read a an article by Craig O'Shaughnessy about the rally length. And Craig says, Craig says the rally length is, was five shots. The average rally length for the match was five shots. And now, now I'm saying, what's up? What's up with that? Because I thought the average rally length is supposed to be four shots or less. And those are the most important ones to focus on. This kind of throws a wrench in the whole system here when the, when the rally length's going over five. And Rafa was very inconsistent. So I'm, I'm thinking on clay, and Rafa's playing better, the rattling's going to go up to six shots or maybe more. And that sort of busts a hole in this big theory, but maybe, maybe not. I don't know. Let's debate it. Michael Furman is watching. Wait a minute. That's my online business manager, my OBM. Online business manager. Sammy. What's up, buddy? Get in here. Sammy, come on. Oh, Sammy boy. You're the most popular guy in this program. That's right. You and me. Sunday nights. Look at that face. Look at the face, guys. That is pure joy. When I rub Sammy's belly, it's just pure heaven for him. All right, let's see what we got here. Michael Furman is watching. Hugo Ball Green is watching. I know, Sammy gets all the hearts and love. Maha Vishnu Leon. Leon. Leon is watching. Thank you for waving, man. Appreciate it. Getting some folks from around the world on the program. We've got high IQ viewers from around the world, not just in the US. I've got a strong following over there in Shanghai and on the other side of the globe. And I don't know what time it is or what day it is over there, but Australia, I've got some fans on the other side of the globe that like this program. Thank you guys, I appreciate it. Jim Kane says, this is my buddy Jim. Jim, you're back. A very intelligent coach from Massachusetts. And he says, it seems to me that Rafa and Novak had similar journeys back from some medical concerns. Hi, Chris. Novak derived perfect 10. Rafa not all the way back yet. Yeah, I, that sounds like what's going on. Bottom line, Novak was magnificent. I have a technique question. Jim, throw me the technique question. I love technique questions. You know that technique is where my heart is at. 
Novak plays kind of Spanish, doesn't he, guys? I mean, he's solid, isn't he? Isn't he able to rally more than four shots effectively? I'm being a little sarcastic here, but it seems to me that Novak is very solid past four shots. I think he can go pretty long distance. What do you guys think? I bet when Novak was a kid, he trained more than the first four shots. What do you guys think? Do you think he trained only the first four shots or he was training a lot of long rallies? I bet he learned to be patient and, and grind as well as, as well as attacking. You know, it has to be a balance, right? Shouldn't it be a balance? Because it's not all about the first four shots, is it? Or is it? Is that what tennis is all about now? Because the game is changing? I don't know. I read another article that said the women's game is totally changed now. It's all about first strike. Is that true? Is tennis all about first strike? Really? I want to see... I want to see those statistics. I want those statistics to be verified by someone other than the person who's claiming the statistic. I want to see those statistics verified by an independent third party or second party or some party who's not also who's not who's not I, I want to say selling services and products let's just put it that way all right Ganesh Kumar is watching Jeremy Malfay is watching Jeremy is the star of the show it's not me and it's not Sammy it's Jeremy what's up Jeremy I gotta catch your latest video buddy Jeremy's putting out videos every week now I gotta check that out I think Jeremy's a young star in the making, in the coaching world. And he's on the most intelligent talk show on the planet and on the internet tonight. Good job, Jeremy. You chose the right one. Larry R. Klein is watching. We've got the regular. The whole family's here. Tim Baton says, what's up, brother? The heavyweights, he's here. The legend. Tim, you know what's cool? I have an article by you. I think it's in PTR or was in PTR. And it's about marketing and branding. And I have it back then. It's probably from a year ago or something. And I have it cut out of the magazine, PTR magazine. And I kept it because it was so good. And it's about developing your brand and marketing. You, you made a whole list of activities that coaches should do to brand themselves. What an awesome article that was. Very insightful and intelligent. It makes sense because... You're now on the most intelligent talk show on the internet, for tennis, that is. But yeah, it was an amazing article, and I have it, and I have it to reread. I'm going to reread it later this week. I, I got to get the title. I, I, would, I would promote it, you know, and promote the, and give you a plug or a shout. I'm trying to give you a shout out here, but excellent work. I didn't even know you back then. You were just putting out so much good stuff, putting out a lot of good stuff, and still doing it. Awesome. All right, let's see who else is on the show. Patrick Franco Jr., another regular. We got all, all the friends are in here. Guys, if you have any tennis questions, shoot them out to me. I've been working about 24 hours this weekend doing the grind, although my grind was a little less because I got my new assistant coach in town, Hugo. Hugo's on the, he was on the show here. I have a new assistant coach from France, and I'm teaching him the Spanish way. So he's going to be one heck of a coach because he's got the French background and France does a great job and he's going to learn all the tricks of the Spanish system. So, you know, I've had a lot of really talented coaches come to study with me and I'm sending them out into the industry to do some damage. Like I have some, some guys who've been working for me the last 10 years and they're moving up the ladder. They're really starting to be leaders. They're becoming leaders of the industry. I had one coach who worked for me here who has now had a player in the Australian, made the second round of the AO. So proud of that. I had another coach who studied with me a long time here who is the head of Saddlebrook Girls ITF. And I have some other coaches here. I have another coach who is one of the best coaches now, junior coaches in New England coming up. A lot of guys came to study with me, and now they're making their mark on the tennis industry, and I think that is awesome. It's nice to see guys who I invested a lot of time and energy into moving up the ladder in the tennis world, you know, becoming big shots of their own. I think that's so cool. All right, 
Gloria Argul is what? Wait a minute, Gloria, she, she's on my ambulance co. What's up, Gloria? How are you? I hope you're feeling better. I hope you had a good, was it surgery? I know you were, you were feeling ill. I'm sorry you had to take that medical leave. Salifu Muhammad is watching. Salifu, you're a regular now on the show, buddy. Salifu is one heck of a tennis player, guys. One very talented tennis player and a very good coach. Tim Baton says, I'll ask a question about growing. Wait a minute. This is not a business show. This is a tennis show. All right, you can ask it because you're a big shot. I'm going to take it. I'm going to take the question. Chris, you have this great space in Vermont. Take a sidebar for a second and educate coaches how you do that. How do you find a space and how do you make it successful? Well, so I bought a club. How cool is that? Is that every coach's dream to buy a club, a little piece of their own with their own tennis courts? And I happen to get my own clay courts, you know, my red clay. I had to have the red clay, you know, the Spanish way, the European way. So I have indoor hard and my own red clay courts, which, which is like the greatest dream for me. I'm telling you that I'm in paradise. I'm in heaven, absolute heaven, when I'm at my club in Vermont. So I can't be there full time, but I have some coaches working there. And I have some other coaches interested in moving in there. And we, we run some light programming there. Nothing really serious. I'd like to actually blow it up more. But we're still sort of in the renovation phase because I bought this club and it was completely abandoned. It was really in bad shape. And it wasn't really for sale. There was like a dude leasing it. And I just came in with an offer and I said, I, 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 gotta, I wanna make you an offer and would you be willing to sell? And it just goes to show you that sometimes, you know how they say everything's for sale? Well, this club wasn't for sale, but it was, and the owner was looking to get out and I was able to get in. And it's very hard to, to get a, a, a gem of a club like this. You know, these are, there are these small clubs that were built sort of in the 70s and 80s. They're dotting around the country, they dot the country. And sometimes you can find these little gems, and that's what I, get, I did, and I got it for a pretty good price. And I'm, I'm, I'm telling you, two or three years in, I, I feel like it may be the best purchase I ever made because now I have a home. I have a home for my summer academy. I have a home for my brand. I have a home for my online academy because now it's become like a film studio. I'm using the club as a film studio where I can film all my online courses and all my digital content. And I can use this, the club because I own the space there. I don't have to pay rent. And I can use that space to innovate and launch my digital products. So that, that I think is really exciting to use the club as a film studio, a, a digital content studio, because I know a lot of guys who are branching out online are actually struggling. They have to buy court time sometimes, especially if they're from a cold weather region. But... I think you always have to keep your eye out. What I used to do is whenever I drive around the country, I'd always look for tennis clubs and you know, see what's available and learn. And, and this was a club I had my eye on for a long time. And I just sort of had a, a, a hunch that I could make an offer and, and the guy would want to get out. And, and we were able to make it happen. It was so difficult because sometimes those negotiations can be really, they can get heated and they can become, they can become very challenging, let's say, the negotiation over the purchase, and then you have to get the financing or figure out how you're gonna, how you're gonna actually you know, buy it unless you have cash. Most people don't have cash for a purchase like that. So yeah, it was a really, really difficult negotiation actually. And we were able, to, it was tenuous sometimes, and we were able to pull it, pull it off. And now I have my home. I have my home away from home. And if I could just live there, I, I probably would, but my family and I are settled down here in New York City, so I'm only three and a half hours away. But I don't know if that answered any questions, but I'm just rapping about my club. But. All right, what's Michael Furman talking about? All right, Zoe, Joy, Zoe Jew, Jew is watching. Hey, Zoe, that's, that's my buddy. Hey, how are you? Jim Kane says, the young female player you worked with was impressive with the parabolic foreign. Was that on the show today? Yeah, hey, that was... That was a good show, right, Jim? We did two shows to get today, guys. Do you have any questions about my reality show that we did today? We did two of them. And I thought they were very good, very good shows. I don't know why I don't have 100 or 200 live views on that. 
we get a, a trickle of views. I think those shows are so great. Maybe I'm biased, but I think they're awesome. And I don't know many coaches who are filming their live lessons unscripted and throwing it out there for the world to see. I don't know many guys doing that. I'm doing that, and I think the shows are fantastic, especially if you're interested in technical work. We're doing a lot of technical work right now. Let's see what the question is. Yeah, didn't she have a nice fade at the end? She had a nice drift. That's a, that's a new term, new technical term. We got the drift, we have the inverted finish, we have the parabolic swing shape. These are all my technical terms that I've been using and I have them trademarked. No, I'm just kidding, they're not, they're not copyrighted or trademarked, but I like them. How important was it for my student for her back leg to come around on the landing to help her beautiful forehand? No, Jim, ask away, ask as many questions as you like. Yeah, her back leg has to come around. She has to either pivot around and land square, or she can jump and land square. And those are the two options because that helps the parabolic swing shape. When you get the hips rotating like that, and the foot coming around, that helps the round swing shape, the circular swing path. And so one of the tricks that I learned when I was building the forehand over the years was that a lot of the kids would come to me really stiff and linear. And I needed to break that motoric habit. I needed to break that muscle memory. And the way that I broke it up is I told the kids to jump. And that sounds kind of nuts, but I, I, I got the kids jumping in place, but with balance. And I got them spinning their hips. So I found that if I could get the kids to spin their hips in midair, which is very, I would say unorthodox and very much against the classic traditional approach to get the kids airborne. But if I could get them airborne, I could get their hip to spin. And if I could get their hip to spin, I could promote this round parabolic shape, like throwing a hook in boxing. Pa, you guys know I like to box. You know, like throwing a hook. And if I could get that, I could break that old muscle memory. I could break that motoric habit, that linear stiff swing that you see so often, in, at least in, the Ameri in America, in the US, you see it so often coming out of red ball and coming out of orange ball. And so that's sort of what I did. That's the innovation that I did. And I, I took a risk. I just start, started trying it with certain students. And I noticed that it, it also helped to loosen up their arm and it helped with the elasticity. That's sort of how it all started. Jeremy Speicher is watching. What's up, man? I think you've been on the show before. I appreciate all you guys tuning in. Let me know if you have any tennis questions. Drexler Ingwa Dai is watching. Another regular on the program. Must be smart if you're tuning in weekly. Michael Furman says, research about the technical game at prodigymaker.com. Prodigymaker.com is my blog. And it's my vlog, my vlog. It's my vlog, and it's my vlog. And it's where I house all of the knowledge. I'm dropping all the knowledge on prodigymaker.com, trying to make parents, coaches, and players smarter around the world. Smarter and more wise, more sagacious. Jeremy Malfay says, hey, Chris, thanks for the shout out. Jeremy, if you're on this program, I think you've got a future, man. I, I'm sensing something great in the future for you in my crystal ball. You're like one of those guys who come study with me and then ends up leading the industry. Tim Baton says, coaches have to know how to bring people to their courts. Right. Well, I, I, I'm still growing this club. You know, I'm looking right now for a coach to, to take over the club in the wintertime because I'm there in the summer and I'm blowing it up in the summer. So I'm looking for a guy, an independent coach who wants to come in and actually run programs in the winter. I have a guy coming in to interview next month. I'm very excited about that. And I think it's an unbelievable opportunity for someone who wants to live in the mountains in this beautiful area and build a program. It's a great opportunity. I mean, it, it's just a blank slate. It's the, the club we're still renovating. It's in pretty good shape. It's not like a beat up place anymore. It's in good shape, but I have so many plans. I'm going to make it a high tech club. I'm going to install a play site. I'm going to wire it as my studio for digital content. And we're going to have everything there. I want to have, I got the red clay. I got the indoor hard. I want to put some 
high-tech gym equipment in there, you know, the latest in, in equipment, technology. I want the whole club to be cutting edge and to be a, a place where we can do advanced research on tennis and where I can do a lot of filming and digital content. So I have lots of plans for my little club, my little slice of heaven, but it's just going to take some time. I'm not a rich man. I don't have big family money. You know, I'm a, a self-made I'm a self-made man. I, I, I got no handout from mom or dad. I built all of this. This was my 10 years of savings. To buy this club was absolutely 10 years of my life saving up my own cap, making, you know, my own capital, my own earnings. I saved it and then I was able to make this deal. And nobody helped me. And my, my parents, I, I don't have any money in my family. It's all, all self, self-earned, you know. Pull yourself up by your own bootstraps, as my grandfather, the general, the general used to tell me. Pull yourself up by your own bootstraps. So this club is the culmination of 10 years of me saving all of those private lessons, all of those group classes, saving up my money and then making that purchase. And now I have the dream and now I just have to sort of digest the club and then I have big plans with the technology, like I said, but the technology is expensive. It's expensive to be on the cutting edge, so I have to save up a little cash and, and then I'm going to make a new investment in the club and really wire it. Wire it so I can inspire. Wire it so I can inspire everyone who comes there and inspire people from around the world with the digital content that we're creating. Nicholas Wagner is watching. There's a guy who studied with me, and there's a guy who is starting to lead the industry. Great junior development coach. I think there's a bright future for this guy, Nick Wagner. You heard it here first. Guy's got some talent. Carlos Carrera is watching. It's funny, when you have a lot of young coaches who come to study with you, and they spend time with you, you start to see talent just like you see talent in juniors. You start to see talent in coaches. And I think that's kind of interesting. You can see the future sometimes. When you see a young coach, they, they have certain way, a certain way about them, a certain learning style, and they have, they, if they have a curious mind and if they're intelligent and they're passionate, you can start to see the future that's coming down the road. And I think I've been able to look into my crystal ball and predict some coaches who are now starting to lead the industry, which is pretty exciting. Orkan. Gassimo is watching. What's up, man? Thanks for joining the show. I appreciate appreciate you joining. We're just chilling tonight. We've been talking a little bit about technique. We've been talking about Djokovic and Rafa. My co-host, Sammy. What's up, Sammy? He's just chilling. He gets to take his nap. I'm going to have to take my nighty night soon, too, because I've got a big day tomorrow working with the ambulance stuff. Tim Baton says, spot on, man. Thank you. Angel Lopez watching. I told you the heavyweights are all coming out. Angel Lopez, big heavyweight from California. Legendary coach from California. What's up, Angel? How are you, my man? Any thoughts, any questions? Post them. We'll get it going. We'll get after it. We'll get after it. We'll get it going. Nate Pagel is watching. There's another dude, man. That's what I'm saying. There's a dude that studied with me. He was here, and I knew it right away. This guy's going to be a leader in the industry. I knew it because he's got smarts and he's got passion. There's another dude right there, another dude who was with me, and now he's going to be a leader. I'm telling you guys, watch out for the Chris Lewitt protégés. Jeremy Malfay says, Chris, can you just talk more about the below-the-shoulder finish on the forehand? How are you teaching this finish to your players? Jeremy, you know I love this subject. You know, come on, man. If you ask me that, I'm going to be talking for like 10 to 15 minutes on that. Everyone's going to get bored of me talking about the parabolic forehand. All right, but I will because I like to answer everyone's question. I figure you have progressions maybe or tips as opposed to just saying finish below your shoulder. Dude, are you watching my shows? That's all I talk about all the time on my shows. You got you to gotta check out all the YouTube archives. I've got... I think I have 19 reality shows right now that are all archived on YouTube. Come on, guys, 19 shows. 
we're going to have at least 30, 40 shows this season. And then we're going to have season two. Season two is going to be amazing. Guys, is this crazy? I almost bought a drone. I was at Best Buy and I almost bought like a thousand dollar drone because I want to have this cool filming set up where like the drone sort of flies around me like some sort of matrix deal and we get all these different angles. It's going to be awesome. I think I'm going to go buy it. I'm going to go buy this drone so we can have better content. What do you guys think about that? That's dedication. That's commitment. Okay, getting back to your question, Jeremy. I got a thumbs up on the drone, I think. I figure you have progressions or maybe tips. All right, all right, I have, of course I have it. Should I get my racket? Hold on, I gotta get my racket, guys. All right, I'll go, you guys will go with me. All right, I'm mobile, I'm mobile. Get my racket. What kind of tips do you want, Jeremy? Tell me what you need, man. I don't know what you need. Oh, Sammy's up. Let me get a racket here. All right, I got a stick. What kind of tips are we talking about here? Guys. All right, I'm going to set this up. Hold on. Let's see what we got here. Okay. Can you guys see this? All right. What's up? Right, so. Guys, you got to stop teaching the follow through up around the neck to the ear, like the, you know, like the listening to the phone call thing or like checking, what do they say? The, the listening to the phone or like putting your watch by your ear. That's got to go. It's got to go bye bye. It's old school. It's dead. Just let it go. Everyone just let it go. Like the song in frozen, let it go. It's over. It's like bell bottoms. I guess they're coming back. Or it's like, you know, something really old that should be put away in a closet or in an attic. You know, like boxed away in an attic. Look, this is what I mean. This thing. Stop teaching that. It's over, people. It's done and gone. The way to finish... Can you see that? It's kind of like, like that, you know, there or there or there, anywhere around there. Can you guys see that? That's where it's at. Stop teaching this, especially without extension. I have so many little kids from Red Ball. I'm seeing dozens and dozens and dozens of, maybe it's because I'm here in New York, maybe not. I think it's around the world, but I'm seeing it here. And the kids do this. this. How many kids do you have do this? It's stiff. It's tight. It doesn't even have good extension. I mean, at least give me this. The extension and then the finish, you know? But man. It's, I don't understand what's going on. Why can't we change? Why we teach red curriculum like it's 1975, 1980? I don't, I don't get it. And then they got to learn good technique later, advanced technique later. Don't do that. Just teach the right technique. Teach advanced technique when they're little. So, what are my tips? I don't. Know, Jeremy, ask me something specific, man. Like, there's too many. It's too complicated because it depends on the kid. I told you, you got to get the hips. You got to get the legs jumping a little. That helps. You got to go in there. The biggest tip, I don't like the word tip that much, but the biggest piece of advice, you know, tip is sort of frivolous or doesn't seem like weighty enough. Like, but fine, let's say tip. The biggest thing I can, I can tell you is to get this elasticity is you got to go in there with your hands and you got to touch the kids. And I'm not saying like a, in a perverted way, like, you know, like a pedophile. I'm saying you got to get in there and manipulate the player's body. And, you know, they do this more in Europe where the coaches aren't as fearful of lawsuits. And I'm being totally sincere now. There are many coaches in the U.S. have been falsely accused of touching the kids improperly. It's really scary because of tort law here in the United States. It's very scary for liability 
when you touch a player. And to be honest, I think it's really hurt our technical development because there are many coaches who try to teach from a distance and they try to use words and they try to use imagery. And in my experience, in the field, in the trenches, that doesn't work that well with a lot of kids. Kids actually need tactile teaching. They need to feel kinesthetically what to do. And in my experience, that's much faster. If you can teach a kid with feel and manipulate their arm and manipulate their body the way you want, the learning curve is much steeper, it's quicker. They learn more faster. And I think that honestly, in the US, a lot of coaches don't teach like that. They're worried about liability and probably re re realistically, they should be. They should be worried about liability. I remember in one of my first workshops, I did a PTR workshop, certification workshop. This is probably going back 20 years. And the coach told us a story about how he had been accused by a young player of improperly maybe showing her some stuff and she felt uncomfortable and it actually almost ruined his career. And I always remember that. That was my very first exposure to coaching in a, a certification workshop and he, he was talking about how his whole reputation had been ruined. And I don't know if it was rightly or wrongly, but, but he said he felt it was unjustified and it was really scary. It was a scary experience for me as a young coach to hear that, that just an accusation could have, could destroy your reputation. So you have to be really careful how you touch a player. And I always have, I usually work with an assistant, so I always have another coach present on court. I think it becomes a lot more dicey and scary if you're working with a player alone somewhere. And you have to be really careful about how you touch a player, you should ask permission and you should not touch a player, I think, so much with your hands so much. You maybe you can usually, I, I maybe touch them with the ball or my racket or I, I try not to touch them directly. But seriously, in Europe, the coaches are much more hands-on and I think because tort law is different in Europe and they have less fear of lawsuits, you see a lot more coaches that are touchy-feely and actually, kind of uncomfortably so. Like I've had a European coaches come to work for me and they get like very close to players where I have to actually talk to them and tell them, look, man, this is, a, this is America, man. You can't touch a player like that. Or, you know, you, you can't do that without asking permission. And they're like, what, what? We do it all the time back home. I'm like, well, you know, you can get sued here for that kind of stuff. And anyway, what's my point? My point is that my biggest tip for you, Jeremy, is, is you got to get in there either with your hands or with somehow physically manipulate the players. And that is the absolute fastest way to make technical progress. And I think it's something that a lot of coaches don't stress. A lot of coaches don't talk about. And I think it's a, a secret. If you want to know one of my, my biggest secrets to being a, a technician, a world-class technician, I consider myself a world-class technician, it's that is that I'm, I go in there and I help the player feel the movement and I help them find the pathway and I help them learn to manipulate their bodies, to have good body awareness, good proprioception, and to, to feel how I want them to move. And I think with, through feeling, the player learns faster. Most kids will learn faster, much more so than with demonstration and visual learning. That's my opinion. And I know in a lot of certification workshops, they stress what? They stress the visual learner. And I just think that's, there's something wrong there because in my experience, most kids kind of learn just visually. They have to learn kinesthetically. They have to feel what, what I want from them. If I just talk to them and make images, it takes a long time. It takes too long. The learning curve is very slow. You know, it takes a long time. Anyway, does that help at all? Maybe it doesn't help, Jeremy. Ask me any follow-ups if you can about technique. Okay, buddy? All right, let's see. We've got a number of other posts here, and I'd like to answer. I'll, I'll try to give you some more technical advice, Jeremy, if you'd like, later. Let me try to get to some other questions here. Guys, how's everyone doing? 
Ready for a big week? Dude, I'm going to be three days studying EMT in EMT school basically for three days, man. I'm going to be off the radar just studying emergency medicine starting tomorrow, 8 a.m. So I'm out. This is my last tennis talk for a while, guys. Take advantage. Pick my brain now. The next three days, I'm going to focus on saving lives. All right. Tim Baton says, anyone can do it. Coaches need to be ambitious. If you are great, try and buy the club. Many clubs available. Yeah. I think that's a coach's dream, right? But most coaches have trouble getting organized. Most coaches have trouble raising the capital. That's a big one. This is 10 years. I saved up for 10 years, okay, guys? That's 10 years of my life to get enough money to get this club going. It was a long grind, like you say, Tim. But yeah, I think if more coaches, it, it depends on their personality. Some coaches don't want that responsibility. They, they don't, they're not ready to own a club. You know, it's a lot different owning a club. I don't think I would buy a big club, Tim, because I didn't want to lose what I do best, and that's coaching. I didn't, I didn't want to stop being a coach. And I know some guys that get into management and they actually lose touch with the teaching court. And I, I, didn't, I really didn't want to do that. So I think I, I did it just right. I, I'm so lucky. I have this perfectly sized club that I can manage. I can manage it remotely. I have it all wired where I can run everything from my phone, basically. You know, I have it all, all wired through the internet with sensors and I have video there and I can lock and unlock the doors and check the thermostat and I have all of that wired so that I can control the club from anywhere off my phone, which is really cool. And it's just the right size for me where it's not overwhelming and it, it will eat up all of my time where I can't coach or write or do shows like this. You know, I didn't want that. So I just, I feel very blessed and I'm very happy. All right, what else we got here? Mark Kovacs is watching. See, I told you guys, it's a heavyweight night. It's a night of heavyweights. Anytime we got Tim Baton and Mark Kovacs on, you know it's gotta be a big show. Mark, I had a really good question for you on serve mechanics, man. I don't know if you're still out there, but I had a dad ask me if The wind up the power position, if that adds, if that's contributory to acceler acceleration, in other words, if that is contributory to ball speed. And I said, I don't think it is. I think, in other words, you could just start at the same speed as if you brought the racket up in, during the first move and things like that. So I don't know if you're out there, Mark, but if you shout out a quick answer to that, I think it's the, it's, there's no difference, right? The, the idea that the, the beginning movement of the arms contributes to racket speed is, is that a myth? I think it is a myth, but maybe, you know, I, I trust Mark on that more than, more than anyone. You know, I, I, what I'm saying is you could start from a half motion like this and produce the same power as if you do a wind up. That is my question, my biomechanical question. And that's my biomechanical question for the night. Peter Banyas is watching. Oh my, all my buddies are on the show tonight. What's up, Peter? Peter's one heck of a player and a great coach. We missed you today, bud. Peter helps me out with my classes. And one heck of a tennis player. Very talented guy right there. Let's see. Michael Furman says, watch our young players progress on YouTube. Yeah, so all these shows, this is my Facebook show, but we have YouTube shows that are all archived on our channel. It's at YouTube forward slash Chris Lewitt. They're all archived there. And like I said, we have already 19 shows archived. You can watch me. You can binge watch Chris. You can binge watch my shows all day long if you want, like on a weekend, like Game of Thrones. But it's me and I'm talking tennis all day along with my students. Yeah, so we have these students that I'm following. You know what the really cool thing is, guys? My students are getting into it. Like, I don't know if any other coaches have ever done this before where they've had weekly shows of their lessons. And the students are really getting into their, their they're getting into character. You know, they're, they're the stars of the show. For the first time, they're, I guess it's the YouTube generation, but they, they, they get excited. They're coming to class. They're watching their shows. How about that? They're watching their own show 
during the week. So they're watching their own lessons and they're learning. They're getting reminded of what they were working on. You know, things like that. Pretty cool, I think. That's something I didn't anticipate. You know, I thought maybe some students might be reluctant or hesitant to be live. And, and maybe I have some students who don't want to do it, but a lot of the students are really into the idea and they love being the star. That's a, that's a cool thing. All right. Bill Patton is watching. What's up, man? No cheating. Go get Bill's book. It's a no cheating book. Come on. Nick Wagner says, was that Lauren on the show today? I still have the joke book she bought me. Keep it in my bag. Still a hit with the young ones. Nick, that's a great book. I should have a book like that. Yeah, that is Lauren. Can you believe it? She got big, right? She's been with me a few years. I think her technique's starting to look pretty good. That's what Jim was asking. He was asking about Lauren's technique. I just had to do it. I almost threw her out this year because she was pissing me off. So I, I had to have a serious heart-to-heart -heart with Lauren. And I was like, Lauren, you got to be willing to work on your technique with me because things are going downhill here. Your technique's deteriorating. And I'm really worried about your future. And to be honest, I'm not going to babysit you. So I had to have a big heart-to-heart. -heart and I told her, you know, it's either kind of my way or you got to go. And she's kind of turned things around this season, so I'm proud of her. Because you know how I am, Nick. If I don't like the way the kid's working, man, they got to go. You know, I'm not going to stand for that. I'm not going to stand there for a whole season and feel like a babysitter. I'm going to replace that player with someone who wants to work. All right, Andrew Noblet is watching. Is that Andrew that I, that I know? What's up, buddy? How you doing? Thanks for joining the program. Mohammed Nag... Na, I always mess up the last name, Muhammad. I'm sorry, man. Is it Naje or Nage? I'm sorry, man. But Muhammad's an excellent coach. Is that my Shanghai buddy? What's up, man? From Shanghai. How you doing? I'm enjoying your videos that you're posting on Facebook, bud. Thank you so much. I, I enjoy that. I love seeing your little guys, right? I anytime you post a video of like a 7, 8, 9, 10-year-old, I'm on it. I'm going to watch that because... I'm the prodigy maker. I got to keep up my reputation. Jeremy says, I knew you'd say that. Ha, ha, ha. What did you know I'd say, Jeremy? I'm sorry. Did I do something wrong? Jeremy, if you have a follow-up question about, like, tips or something, I will try to answer. I don't like the word tips. I like the word wisdom and giving advice, something more concrete. Tips to me is something short and frivolous. Like, hey, I'll give you a one-minute tip on the tennis channel. That's a bunch of shuck and jive, those tips. You know, it's hard to learn with tips, man. A lot of times tips are too simple. They're too short, and you lose the background. You lose the detail. So, you know, maybe I'm being silly with the semantics, but I like to say I'll give you some advice. You know, I, I try not to give out tips. But let me know if you need any tips, okay, Jeremy? Let me know, man. I'll, I'll, I'll try to throw some at you. I try to help with the forum, but maybe ask me something specific, like, I don't know, how do you get that? But you got to come over here. Jeremy, you're not far away, right? You're in the Northeast. You should come up here. Come up here and get on the court with me. I got a lot of guys who do that. Why don't you come for a weekend or something and hang out with us? And then you can, you can absorb everything and really see it for the way I do it. But you're going to learn everything. If you watch the shows, if you watch the reality shows week by week, like watch what's going to happen by springtime, by summer, by next season. If you watch these kids progress, all these kids that Michael mentioned, you watch these kids progress over the next six months or a year, you're going to see some unbelievable transformations. You're going to see a metamorphosis, a metamorphosis with all these students of mine, especially the ones that are doing the technical work. Some kids were working a little more tactically. They're a little farther along in their development. Tim Treat is watching. What's up, man? Thanks for joining the program. I think you're a regular on the show. I appreciate all the regulars tuning in. I got all my buddies, my high IQ tennis friends. And we got some heavyweights on the show tonight. Big time guys. Jeremy Malfay says, I have made a few kids do a 180 to 360 jump while hitting to force them to use their legs and rotate. Well, I think 360 is asking a lot, Jeremy, unless you got a little LeBron there. 
But I'm thinking I got to get my geometry right. 90 to 180. I'm thinking 180, bud. I'm thinking about 180 is where it's at. If you can get a full 180 or anywhere between 100, 180 rotation, seriously, that's pretty good. And that'll help loosen up the hip. And that'll help get you that circular swing. Because what happens is, okay, I'm going back. Here we go. I've got my racket. So you got these little kids and they're swinging like this. And it's all arm. It's army. And what you got to do is get them to release their hip. And that'll help pull the racket through, you know, like the ATP swing. You got to get that hip moving. And the kids haven't learned to fire the hip. They haven't learned to do nothing with the hip. They're just swinging with their arm because their coaches in red ball tell them to follow through above the shoulder like, like a drone army of kids just following through old school above the shoulder. And then usually the coaches don't even get them to extend. I mean, at least they could get the kids to extend in red ball, but they don't. The kids just go from impact to follow through. So they go impact, follow through, and it's all arm. They're producing the energy from the arm. And what you have to do is release the hip and that helps to pull the racket through and it creates that, that energy and that's what they call the, you know, it's part of what they call the ATP style swing. Another thing that I think is crazy is you got these guys running around England and sorry to anyone who's English who's watching, but they're probably not watching because it's late at night there or it's the morning, early morning there. But in England, I'm telling you, it's like a cult group where they all are talking GBA, game-based approach. In other words, you can't teach too much technique first, which is bananas land. And also, they all say the same thing. They all say, what is this ATP forehand from the US? They all, they all make fun of the ATP forehand. Like they're making fun of Rick Macy. They're making fun of Dr. Brian Gordon. Like, what's up with that? Like, there's just no respect over there in England relating to us teaching the technique, you know? They're just crapping on us. And I don't know if that's an English thing where they, they think us guys here in the U.S. are stupid, but I don't, I don't know. I don't, I don't know what's going on, but they, they say that they don't understand. They think it's foolish that we call it the ATP4. I mean, come on. Think, what's a better name? It's a good name. ATP4 is a good name. Simple, easy to remember, conjures up the ATP. It, it, it describes the, the, you know, the stretch shortening cycle. The, you fire your hip, your arm goes on stretch, and then you, you, know, you, for lack of a better term, you get that sort of lag and snap deal happen. I know a lot of people don't like that term either, but whatever. You, know, you get that lag, and then the racket whips through. And that's sort of what the ATP forearm is all about. It's like getting a lot of energy in a compact swing. And you've got these jokers running around England, and they're, they're, just, they're just crapping on that whole phrase and that whole teaching methodology, you know, like what Macy's doing. Macy's brilliant, okay? I'm here to tell you guys, Macy's doing a great job. And Dr. Brian Gordon's a very good biomechanist, in my opinion. You know, he's doing some good research. You don't agree with everything, but come on, these guys are smart. They're doing a good job. Why can't we call it the ATP forum? Anyway, okay, so you got the little kids, and they're doing that kind of deal, right? And you got to load and get the hip going. Load and jump. You load and jump. You teach those kids to free up the hip so they're not linear anymore, and then lo and behold, you start getting this parabolic swing shape. It's, it's like a miracle. You can start getting the circular swing. But if you try taking a kid like that, and you try to teach them the parabolic swing from a closed stance when they've been taught linear their whole life, it just doesn't work, man. It, it, it's like trying to go against the grain. It, it, it's like trying to, it's like going to the dentist, man. You just can't get, it's so hard to get a kid who's, they're wired to be linear and tight like that. It's very hard to get that kid parabolic and get the hip firing the right way and to get that spinning action going. Anyway, so what I, what I did was, when I noticed that the kids have been taught that way, kids who come to me who are taught that way, I get them to jump. 
I get them to jump and do a spin in midair. Sounds kind of crazy, but it's not crazy. It, it's, it's not crazy. I'm not crazy and I'm not stupid. I get them to spin in midair, but with balance, and it frees up the hip. And then I can start going to work on the parabola. I can start to go to work on the curved swing path. So that's, that's kind of how I do it. I hope that helps. Let me know if you have a follow-up on that, you know. Jeff Contreras is watching, another regular, right? We've got all the regulars tuning in. Thanks, guys. Thanks for supporting the show. Wait a minute, Gordon Paul's on the program. Another friend of the show. What's up, Gordon? Gordon's coming to my workshop next month. I'm going to shout it out. February 18th and 19th. Do you want to learn how to build the parabolic forehand, the ATP forehand, whatever the hell you want to call it? You want to learn that? Come to my workshop. February 18th and 19th, it's at my club. Did I mention I have a club? Yes, I did. My little slice of heaven. It's at my club. We won't be on the red clay. We'll be on the indoors, unfortunately. Summertime, we're going to get out in the clay. But anyway, we have that workshop coming up. It's called World Class Technical Development and Building Prodigies. So I'm going to share all of my experiences working with top juniors, really prodigious little kids. I've been very fortunate enough to train and be involved with a lot of top young talents. And so I feel I have a lot of experience to share on that front. And we're going to be talking about my technical development system, you know, my methodology, how I do it. We're going to be talking about the forehand, the, my footwork approach, the way I basically build all the strokes. We're going to go through all the strokes in two days. And I'm going to share my methodology. That doesn't mean I'm going to shove my methodology down the coach's throats. It means I'm going to share my progressions. And actually, I don't think everyone has to teach it exactly the way I do, but I, I think the way that I do it, the method, the progressions are really cool and really innovative. And if you use those progressions, you can build basically any technique that you want. So it doesn't have to be exactly my technical system that you're teaching. It's more about the method of teaching it. What I mean by that is the steps that you take, the progressions, and not necessarily the exact technique. The method that I use can be, you can teach any way you want. You can make anything technical. You can build motoric skill with my method and it can be any skill that you want to teach. So that's kind of what I'm getting at there. You don't have to copy exactly what I'm doing in terms of the mechanics, but the way that I'm teaching it, I think is really good, really, and it, it's quick and it's efficient you know and that's what I'm selling I'm selling a way to teach technique that's better and faster you know that's what I'm all about teaching technique faster certainly faster than the GBA approach in England my god sorry if you're English but I'm just so tired of those guys shitting on us over here why are they shitting on us coaches here you know saying ATP is no good ATP forehand you can't call it that why can't you call it that it's a perfectly legit name why can't you call it that? It's a perfectly good name. There's nothing stupid about it at all. And it makes sense. And shitting on us here in the U.S. that we focus too much on technique, like Rick Macy's a shitty coach or something. Come on, he's a great coach. And he teaches a lot of good technique to young kids. He does a really good job, in my opinion. Is he perfect? No. Is he a legend? Yes. Is he mo maybe one of the most dynamic coaches, charismatic coaches I've ever seen? Yes. And why, why are people over or across the pond shitting on him and shitting on us, you know? Why do we got to teach everything in a game? It doesn't have to be that way. You can teach technique first and still develop very good players. I don't want to go off on a rant here because I will. Gordon Paul says, what's up? What's up, Gordon? I'm just chilling. I'm trying not to get upset and go on a rant. Try not to name names, because I always get in trouble when I name names. Collins Abamu CFT is watching. What's up? Think you're a regular. Brian Bleem is watching. What's up, Brian? Another, another regular on the program. Building a big family of intelligent learners here. I like it. Every Sunday night, 9.45 p.m. You know where to tune into. Danny Hayato is watching, another regular. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks for waving. I appreciate all the shout outs. I love it. Miguel Angel Bustamante is waving. Great name. Awesome.
Thanks for tuning in. Thanks for waving. I appreciate it, guys. Brian Bleem says, Hi, Chris. Keep up these podcasts. That's right. It's not a podcast, but close enough, right? I think it's better than podcasts because we can look at each other eye to eye, face to face, tete a tete. We can have this tete a tete dialogue. I think it's even better than a podcast. But yeah, a pod I thought about podcasts too, but I really, I'm digging this Facebook Live format. I really like it, guys. I like, I like the interaction. I like the comments. And let's just face it, you know, this is not a face for radio. This is a face for TV. You know it and I know it. You know it, guys. You know what I'm saying. All right. Gordon Paul says, how is Cornell Tennis doing? I don't know, man. They're doing... I think they're doing pretty well, they're better than when I was there, but they had some ups and downs, they've had a lot of coaching changes. That's a good question, I gotta catch up with that. I'm still in touch with my old coach, but they've had a lot of turnover in terms of coaching as, as far as I know. And they're not dominating the Ivies, you know. I'm so impressed with Columbia, Harvard, Brown had a great run for a while. I would love to see Cornell make a run and dominate the Ivies, but they just can't seem to get their act together. I don't know what's up with that, you know? Brian Bleem has a question. Is it a technical question? Yes, that's good, Brian, because that's my passion, technique, the hardware. I like software, but I love hardware. Could you go over the two-hander grip that you teach? Yes, absolutely, I will do that because I have my trusty racket here. It's actually my son's racket. All right, let's do that. Jeremy, I'm not gonna have to pass the USPTA grip exam again, am I? All right, here we go. All right, so the right hand, it's weird because on Facebook, it comes out, it looks like I'm holding my left hand, but this is my right hand. All right, so that grip on the right hand the dominant hand, for a right-hander obviously, should be continental, right? So, everyone has kind of a different variation of continental, but you know, it should, should be like a uh, volley grip, and it should be also the slice backhand grip. And that will be the, usually that is the two-handed grip for the right hand, the dominant hand. Now you have some options on the left hand. For the non-dominant hand, you have kind of the traditional Eastern where you shake hands with your left hand. And that's pretty classic. You know me, I like to go a little more modern and I, I like to encourage some of the kids to go a little more semi-Western with the left hand so they can get more spin, more RPM. So that's kind of where it's at right now. I don't know what the next technical evolution will be on the two-hander I'm waiting for. As I've mentioned to you guys, I think the two-hander hasn't changed that much compared to, let's say, the forehand, the ATP forehand, which I'm not allowed to call that, or all, my, all the people in England are going to call me stupid or stupid. You can't fix stupid, can you? I, I don't know why I can't call it the ATP forehand. It's just a perfectly good name. It's very short and simple. It's concise. I like it sends a message, but I'm not allowed to call it that. I'm stupid. I'm stupid if I call it that. Anyway, so does that help answer? The right hand is almost always in the continental. You see with a lot of girls, sometimes they hold a forehand with the right hand. Or you see a lot of young kids, they don't change the grip to continental. I think that's a mistake. I think you should try to hold the right hand in, in continental. Fair enough, pretty basic. There's actually some great articles on tennisplayer.net about the different backhand, two-handed backhand variations. I encourage you to look up that resource. It's called tennisplayer.net. It's a wonderful technical resource. A lot of my technical underpinning as a coach has come from Tennis Player and John Yandel. John Yandel has been a huge mentor for me and he's a very intelligent guy, another, I would say, very high IQ tennis mind. And John Yandel is a brilliant analyst of technique. And he published and has, he publishes and has published tennisplayer.net 
over a decade now, probably longer. I'm thinking maybe almost 15 years. And it's absolutely hands down the best technical resource I think you can find on the internet. And I'm not embarrassed or shy to plug it because it's helped my career so much, helped my understanding of technique. He has a lot of high-speed video footage there and a lot of very good articles from biomechanists and leading coaches. So some of the people that I mentioned, like Rick Macy, and Brian Gordon, and people like Mark Kovacs, and many other leading coaches and tennis minds have contributed to TennisPlayer.net. I've written myself many articles for TennisPlayer.net, but it has a technical bent. It has a technical focus. So if you're interested in technique, I encourage you to look into that resource. And I remember on TennisPlayer.net, there's a, a particularly good article by John Yandel on the two-handed grip variations, exactly the question that you had. Tremendous article with animation, video animation. And the gist of the article is that the grip structure will affect the arm position at impact. So John Yandel was making the case that, for example, for some of the women that hold the forehand grip with their right hand, a lot of times they don't extend as much. They don't get as much extension through the, through the ball and things like that. So there, there are some interesting connections potentially between the grip structure and the arm position at impact, things like that. Uh, so check out that resource if, you, if you're able to do so. But basically those are the, the grips. I don't know where the two-hander is going. What do you guys think? Tell me this. Is this crazy? Oh, two-handed backhand. When are we going to learn to follow through low? You know, to get sort of like a low finish. When is someone going to innovate and try that? Like the way it is on the forehand with the inverted finish. Is someone going to try that with the two-hander? I haven't really seen it yet. We start to see some follow-throughs to the side of the shoulder. We see some, some, some players finishing across. But I'm waiting for the next technical evolution on that on that front, possibly. I don't know for sure how it exactly is gonna pan out. Or is someone gonna do a reverse? I'm waiting for someone to do a reverse. So you go here and maybe come around, which it looks, it looks stupid, it looks stupid, it looks kinda silly, but I'm waiting for that innovation. You know, all innovations look silly before they become commonplace. So I'm waiting for that when you're late, if a player can reverse the two-handed backhand, I'm looking for that. And I'm looking for someone to turn the finish down, to invert the finish with the two-handed. No one's doing that. And it may not be te technically possible or biomechanically possible, but I'm looking for some change, some innovation. The other innovation that I, I've predicted is that more players may switch to a one-hand forehand on both sides. So you have a modern right-handed forehand and a modern left-handed forehand. Dare I say ATP forehand, you have it on both sides. And I have this, I've been working on this where we have this style of holding the racket. So I was on Facebook and I call this the preacher grip. This is kind of crazy guys, but it's where you hold the racket like you're praying, prayer grip, preacher grip. And what it does is allow you to have two forehands with a normal racket without losing, without having to lose part of the racket by choking up. Like normally with two forehands, you have some of the butt cap showing uh, players that have two forehands historically. So what I'm looking for are players who are innovating with this preacher grip, something that I've been working on, kind of experimenting with. And then you could slide up for this side and you can slide up for this side, like when you're returning serve. And that way you don't lose an inch or two choking up for one of the forehands, right? So I call it the preacher grip. And the ready position would look something like that. You know? And the thumbs are on top, like that. Like I said, kind of like you're, um, a little bit like you're praying, right? So you slide up for, let's see. So on this side, okay, so this way, you slide up, this way, oh, that's my back end, okay, now this way, lefty, it'd be like that. No, that's my back end.
Sorry, I'm not left-handed. Okay. It'll be that and that. So I'm looking for someone to innovate with a new grip structure so they can play double-handed. Not double-handed, double forehand. And I, ex I think that's a legitimate potential future trend for a technique. It's a little out there. I, I'm not teaching that yet to my students. I'm just saying I, I wouldn't be afraid to do it. If I can convince a parent to allow me to teach uh, two forehands, I'm going to start teaching two forehands instead of a two-handed backhand. I, wanna, I definitely want to experiment with that in the coming years. I'm really excited about trying that. So I haven't done it yet, but I think it's on the horizon, at least for me and my work. I'm waiting for a kid to come who I can get serious about that. I just need a parent to sign on and, and do it with me, you know. So well, I think we had another question on technique here. So Bri I think Brian had another question on technique, right, Brian? I'll try to answer. I don't know. I got off on the two-handed, four, uh, the, the double-sided forehand. But the reason why I think the double-sided forehand, I call it ambi forehand for ambidexter ambidextrous forehand, ambi forehand, because I, I don't know where the two-hander can go. A two-hander is really good, but I think a one-hander would be, essentially be better. It would be better to have two forehands than the two-handed backhand. You have more reach, and you can reverse more easily with the one-handed shot. So I think there's some potential for two forehands, left and right, but no one's done it yet. It would be really futuristic to see that. There, ha there are a few players on tour right now. There's some guys at the futures level who do that and also serve ambi, serve both arms, serve righty and serve lefty. And there are, there's one or two, I know at least one guy on the challenger circuit. So that's all the way up to about 200 in the world who are playing, who is playing ambi two forehands so it it is possible to do it i just want to see it done more frequently and i want i think it could be a, a future trend for technique so that's maybe off topic but you were asking me about the the back end you know the two-handed back end and i see that, that as a potential evolution for the two-handed back end the one-handed forehand you know, actually, the two-hander actually evolving into a, a forehand. Anyway, I, you know, I'm just uh, thinking outside the box here. So Brian had a technical question. I'll try to get to that. What do we got? Brian says, how about the reasoning for separating the pointer finger from the middle finger on the serve and forehand? Okay, so we got, let's see. So Brian's saying... Separating the pointer finger, is that the index finger, from the middle finger. Yeah, so I think there probably should be a spread there. I think every player is different. So the way you hold the racket is with your hand is a very individual thing. And I don't think we should dictate that too much. I will tell you that I always try to include more control, but if... What I don't like is when a player fists the racket, like kind of hold it like a fist. You know, I like to see a little spread in that finger. Absolutely. So I, I think that's what you're asking, and I think that's good advice. I don't know where it comes from, and I don't have any sports science evidence that that gives you more control. It's purely anecdotal based on what good players have taught me, ha have shown me, and what people that I've studied with have told me, and... What I myself, I'm a pretty high level player. That's the way I like to hold it as well. So that's all I can tell you. I like to teach technique based on evidence, but this is probably an area that there is no evidence, there's no data or research. It's more anecdotal evidence. I guess that is a form of evidence, but it's not scientific. So I would say yes, you don't want to fist the grip too much. That being said, if you have a really talented player and that's the way they like to hold the stick, they might know better than you, man. Sometimes with the most talented athletes, they know better than us. We're the dumb coaches and they're smarter than us. Their intuition is better than our knowledge. And it's like that with some very good athletes. They know better through their instinct. You know, so I don't know. Send me a follow up if you have it. Right? Guys, I appreciate you tuning in.
We've got David Poole waving. Derek Taylor is waving. Thank you, guys. I appreciate it. I think we've got some regulars back. A lot of building a strong following here, guys. Very exciting to get all these waves and shout outs. I really appreciate it. I appreciate you guys tuning in and saying hello. It makes me feel very positive about the show. It makes me happy to broadcast live to you guys every Sunday night, 9.45 p.m. I'm trying to take a long-term view of this show and my reality show because I want the audience to grow really big and it takes time. I have to be patient, right? I have to be patient. I think you just keep doing good quality work and you, you have to do some promotion and then hopefully the show will take off. Friends will tell friends, people will share and I want to get this show, especially this Q&A show, broadcast on multiple outlets and really try to build a following, you know, a live following and then a following for the archive of the, all the shows. That's my long-term goal. It's going to take time. It takes time to build trust. It takes time to build an audience. It takes time for people to learn that, even learn that you're doing a show. Some people don't even know that we're doing a good show. So I appreciate you guys tuning in every Sunday. It's really exciting to see the same people asking questions and sharing knowledge and information. I, I love that. And I learn from you guys many times. Uh, as much as I try to share my wisdom, a lot of times you guys have a very good insight as well. And that's kind of the idea. Sharing information with intelligent tennis minds. All right. I think there was another question on the board here. Let's see. Maybe, maybe not. Sean K. Young is watching. Thank you for waving. Appreciate the shout out. Raj Lama is watching. Appreciate the wave. I love these waves, guys. Thank you very much. So it's getting kind of late. If you have any last minute questions, please let me know. I'll, I'll kind of start my wrap up because Sammy's already gone night night. I'll put Sammy on. He's going to get some thumbs up or some love here. Sammy, say good night. That's my boy. Gotta give him some snugs. Here he is, the star of the show. Hey, Sam boy. Hey, I rub his ears here. Okay. Thank you, but where's your blanket? Oh, I guess this, this is what I like to do with Sammy here. It's Sammy night night time. He's got his ducky blanket. You got. So you don't get too chilly. All right, there he is. Want to say good night to everyone? All right, Sammy's got his ducky blanket. He's going night-night. It's time for Chris to get his ducky blanket and go night-night soon. Maybe there's a last couple questions here. Let's see. Brian Bleem says, how about grip pressure on serve as well as strokes? Right, so the grip pressure is another personal feeling. Every player is a little different. I would recommend a relatively light pressure because you want to be able to Sometimes when you grip too tight, it makes the whole lower arm tight. And one of my obsessions is elasticity, right? We're trying to get elasticity. If you watch all my videos, all my shows, all my, all my work on, online that's on our YouTube channel, for example, you see that I'm obsessed with elasticity and looseness in the arm. So I will tell you that if you grip too tight, a lot of times that tension is going to run right up your arm and you're going to lose elasticity in the shot. You know what I'm saying? So the grip pressure should be light. It has to be firm enough so obviously the racket doesn't move around, but just barely enough to hold the racket still as you're swinging it fast because you don't want tension in the arm. I hope that helps. I would say that on the serve, I have a way that I teach the serve. I, I think the grip can be a little tighter in the beginning as you're going up to the trophy. So with young kids on the serve, I like to have them hold a little tighter up into here, up into the power position. Because with young kids, a lot of times the wrist and the, the grip is failing and the racket's flopping back into that waiter position, you know, the tray position. And so I work on that a lot with young kids. So I actually try to have a little firmer hold as they're going up into the 
power position, if that makes sense. And then I try to have them relaxed as they're accelerating upward to the ball. So there, you know, there's, that's one exception where I like to have a little firmer pressure in the power position because so many young kids, you guys probably know what I'm talking about. If you work with young kids, their wrist, the racket sort of collapses like that a lot. They're not able to hold the racket up straight up. You know, my wrist is strong right now. So, you know, I would say that's maybe one exception. That's all I could think of at the moment. Grip pressure. Yeah, I hope that helps. Okay. So, guys, if you have any last-minute questions, let me know. I'd like to encourage you to go to our YouTube channel. It's youtube.com forward slash Chris Lewitt. Chris Lewitt is the... The, the name that you can search on YouTube. Also, you can just go to YouTube and search Chris Lewitt, C-H-R-I-S-L-E-W-I-T. And we have a lot of resources there. Free videos. All of my reality shows are archived there. So we've got a great reality show that follows me around. And right now, we have a lot of live lessons that we're featuring with my, me and my students. So you can go there and watch all the shows. I think we have 19 episodes so far this year or this season, 19 episodes. Check it out on YouTube. And we have all of these Q&A shows. So this talk show, I believe we have 10 episodes. I believe this is the 10th episode, could be the 11th, of our Sunday night live Q&A. So this show is going strong as well. And we have all of the archives of this show. We've had some great conversations over the weeks. And it's all there on YouTube, youtube.com forward slash Chris Lewitt. Tell your friends, please share. If you, if you see a good video, if you, you say, hey, Chris said something really interesting there, something really smart, hopefully, please share with friends and encourage them to watch the show, to join our audience, join our community, and to you know subscribe to the YouTube channel. That would be great. I really appreciate those shout outs. I appreciate you sharing that information with your friends so we can grow our high IQ tennis learning community. That's what I call it. Okay, what else? If you like the show on Facebook, please give me a thumbs up. I appreciate that. If you'd like to become a friend of mine on Facebook, send me that message and I'll try to add you into my Facebook. I hit 5,000 though, so I'm kind of stuck right now. I've got to start adding people to my business Facebook group. I, I got to figure that out. But because I know for my tennis academy, I can get, I can have followers, but in my personal Facebook, I'm loaded. I got 5,000 friends and I'm done. I guess there's a limit. I can't get any more. I keep bumping up against that limit. But anyway, guys, have an awesome night. Check out our archive shows. Check out our reality shows that we just had this week. I did awesome reality shows. You can see me live, unedited, unscripted on court. Check those out. One thing, if you have any comments that I, that I didn't get to, somehow I missed a comment, or if you have a question that comes to mind after the program's over, put it into the comment section of this, of this post because this becomes a post on Facebook. So put any of your comments there, and I will try to check them in the next few days while I'm studying EMT. I'm studying for I'm studying uh, EMT work, emergency medicine, but I'll try to check my Facebook account uh, as best I can, even though I'll be in EMT land, learning how to improve my skills to save lives. I'll be doing that Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. So I got that coming up bright and early tomorrow. I got to get ready, guys. I got to get some shut eye so I can be ready for tomorrow. And I will try to check the postings here and the, you know, the comments and uh, follow up with you guys. So if you have any questions that we missed, please put them on the Facebook post and I will answer them. I try to answer everyone's question. And I will see you guys on the next show. What are we doing? This week I might do an extra reality show maybe something off the court, maybe something with some wisdom that I'm dropping. I don't know. We'll see. I might have a surprise for you guys this week. Have a great night. Have a great week. You know what I always say? God bless. Go out there and give your heart to your students if you're a coach. Give your best on the court. Bring your best energy and intensity just the same way you expect that from your students. Have a great week.
Keep it positive. Remember, no excuses. Champions don't make any excuses on the court and certainly not in life. Let's have a week with no excuses, no complaining, only tough training. Keep it real. Keep it positive. God bless, guys. Have a good night, and I will see you on the next program. See you, guys.